This is KGW News at Noon. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Brenda Braxton, and we start off this noon with day two of a murder trial in Portland. This is a crime that received national attention. Romance novelist Nancy Crampton Brophy stands accused of shooting her husband, Daniel Brophy. He was a popular teacher at the Oregon Culinary Institute. More witnesses took the stand this morning, including a student named Courtney Arias. She told the courtroom she remembers hearing someone yell for help that morning back in 2018. However, she says she wasn't aware there was a shooting, at least not until she heard police talk about it. Now, in court yesterday, emotions ran high as witnesses recounted finding Daniel Brophy dead. Prosecutors ran through key pieces of evidence, including the original 911 call and video surveillance of Nancy's car near the Culinary Institute before anybody else arrived there. Prosecutors say that proves the murder was premeditated, but the defense argued the state's case is purely circumstantial. This trial is expected to last for several weeks, and at some point, Crampton Brophy is expected to take the stand in her own defense. We'll certainly let you know what happens both on air and online at KGW.com. Police have now identified the victim in a deadly shooting at Portland State University. Amara Marluk was found dead Monday morning. An autopsy confirms she died from gunshot wounds and police call her death a homicide. Police arrested Keenan Harpole, a PSU student and a former football player there. Police say he turned himself in yesterday. Well, this marks Portland's 26th homicide of the year. Mike Benner explains how city leaders are trying to curb the violence in Portland. This was the scene near Southwest College Street and 6th Avenue overnight. Authorities tell KGW that officers responded to reports of a shooting around 1 a.m. and found a woman dead. The victim is one of more than 22 people to lose their life to gun violence since the start of the year. When we lose a life or uh, shots have been fired or any kind of violence occurs that um, you know, impacts these neighborhoods. It's, you know, I, I feel uh, morally and ethically responsible for those, those items. Mike Myers oversees Portland's Community Safety Division. He says despite the more than 400 shootings in the first few months of 2022, the city is doing a lot to end gun violence in the Rose City. Myers points to the millions of dollars awarded to community-based organizations operating in neighborhoods impacted by the gunfire. Myers is also proud of the expansion of the Park Ranger program and the official launching of both the Police Bureau's Enhanced Community Safety Team and Focused Intervention Team. All of this has been rolled out in the past year. And when asked what's had the biggest impact, Myers said this. It is not one thing and it will never be just one thing that will take the lead in reducing violence in a neighborhood. Myers says it's many things, including community safety plans, similar to what we've seen in the Mount Scott neighborhood. That's where park lighting has been repaired and improved and 18 traffic calming barrels installed to address gun violence and related speeding. Plan, a comprehensive community safety plan rolled out in a community can work that it can reduce gun violence significantly. Maybe so. It just won't bring back the close to two dozen people who have been gunned down in Portland this year alone. Most recently, a woman near the PSU campus, the latest victim of an epidemic that can't and won't be fixed overnight. It's going to take time to get it down. There is no one thing that you can do to go in there and suddenly overnight reduce gun violence in Portland. That was Mike Benner reporting. People have been telling us for a while they're frustrated. They're also overwhelmed by the number of shootings we've seen. So Augustana Lutheran Church is stepping in. It donated money from this jazz concert to a group trying to put a measure on the November ballot to tighten restrictions on gun sales. They can sign online, they can sign the petition online, or basically have to download it and send it in. They can be a volunteer, and it's really enervating and exciting to go out and gather signatures because people say, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. We need to end gun violence. The concert also featured a tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Yesterday marked 54 years since his assassination in Memphis. Now to a program that's vital for finding justice for victims of sexual assault. 
Federal money is helping clear a backlog of untested rape kits, but that funding is running out. Alma McCarty spoke to one of the program's top investigators. We're in such a different place. More than 20 years ago and a thousand miles away, investigator Matt Irvine began working sexual assault cases in Los Angeles County. We thought we were doing our best in good faith, but there was just a lot that we didn't understand. Now with the Portland Police Bureau, he's the sexual assault kit initiative investigator and has been part of the effort to zero out PPB's rape kit backlog. Starting in 2016, when we started getting the first DNA results back, we began to take a look at the underlying cases, reach out to victims, determine if they wanted their cases to proceed. Clearing the backlog of untested kits led to reopened cases, arrests, and 12 convictions. PPB says five cases are still pending trial. Two investigations are currently active. One of the latest guilty pleas was from Frank Hall Jr. Last month, he was sentenced to 18 years behind bars for multiple rapes stretching back 10 years involving two victims. I talked to both of them since the, the plea, and it's a step towards trying to be whole again. Submitting a sexual assault kit is an invasive process, one that can further traumatize survivors. These are folks who didn't think that anybody would ever come back to them. They thought that their cases were, were cold and, and gone. And frankly, we, we could have done a better job by them uh, a decade ago. Irvine said the dedication to clearing the backlog and seeing the cases through till the end has helped everyone involved, from patrol officers and detectives to victim advocates and prosecutors. Though the Saki project will end and grant funding run out, this fall, Irvine says it permanently reshaped the process for the better. We used to look at things like uh, mental illness, addiction, uh, criminal involvement, even homelessness as things that, that somehow made the victims more culpable in what happened to them. And what we understand now is, no, it just makes them more vulnerable. You know, and the people that prey on these folks, they know that. Alma McCarty, KGW News. A new report finds some mixed results when it comes to the way Oregon deals with drug-related issues. Back in 2020, Oregon was the first state to decriminalize possession of small amounts of drugs like meth, LSD, and heroin. Instead of a felony charge, offenders got a maximum $100 fine. The state can waive that fine if someone opts for a mental health assessment, but the numbers show few people do. Out of about 2,000 people cited, only 92 called the hotline. Authorities say they're surprised, but they add it's too early to judge the success or failure of decriminalization. A big donation for Betsy Johnson's campaign for Oregon governor. The Oregonian reporting Nike co-founder Phil Knight just gave her another $750,000. That brings his total contributions to one million. Johnson is in the governor's race, but she's not affiliated with any political party. Oregon is one of five states that does not limit how much money candidates can accept. Wow, what a difference a day makes, right? 24 hours ago, the wind was howling, the rain was pouring down, and we got pounded with hail. Thanks to all of you who sent us pictures of what was going on in your neighborhood. We saw a lot of trees falling onto roofs and roads and cars. What a mess. Yesterday afternoon, the storm knocked out power to some 17,000 homes across Oregon. And then if you head up to Mount Hood, Mother Nature dumped about a foot of snow and it was windy. At the top of the Cascade Express lift, the National Weather Service recorded gusts of 88 miles an hour. Timberline had to shut down yesterday, but it is back open this afternoon. Okay, let's get back down here in town because the weather has calmed down here as well. Joe, we're liking the sunshine we're seeing. Oh, you're going to like it the next couple of days because that's going to be the forecast. And it's hard to believe, uh, can you, the gusts were so intense up in the mountains. Can you imagine trying to stand uh, in blowing snow with gusts up to close to 90 miles per hour? So, yeah, things are definitely on the calmer side. And those lifts are back running uh, up at uh, Tim Timberline and Mount Hood Meadows today. Of course, Timberline had to shut down their lifts because of the windy conditions. But out along the Oregon coast, Stunning conditions this afternoon. We're looking at a temperature of 50 degrees with clear skies 
and our forecast is only going to be getting better over the next couple of days. Here's a live look over at the reserve and a low a temperature of 46 degrees. I have been seeing a decent amount of golfers out there and I tweeted this uh, picture out just a couple of hours ago. Uh, it's it's going to be great golfing weather, not just today, but tomorrow and especially into Thursday. Going up the mountains, uh, things are looking better up there because this time last yesterday we were showing this camera. You couldn't even make out the Timberline Lodge because of all the snow and some of the ice developing on our camera lens. Right now, temperature of 21 degrees. You see 15 inches of snow, but like you said, Brenda, that number should be a little bit higher because there's a lot of blowing snow up in the Oregon Cascades here the last couple of days or so. Pick up a little bit of some scattered showers here throughout parts of Salem and along the Oregon coast, and that'll be kind of the trend here the next couple of hours. By late this afternoon, we'll be seeing a lot of blue skies and very calm spring conditions and like I said, if things get even better heading in the next couple of days by Thursday, we'd be looking at temperatures in the mid 70s. I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. We'll see you then. Thank you, Joe.